in nephrology have you ever had a patient that's come to you with a kidney problem but it has been affected by something in that person's life like their religious beliefs some of our patients <coughs> have uh, peculiar symptoms coming from what they did based on their religious uh, upbringing mm. for example uh, this patient whom i saw i think last week only we admitted in um, so in the hospital who had come with muscle pains and aches he said he stopped passing urine for the last 24 hours and the last urine he remembers was a dark brownish colored urine and uh, i thought uh, okay let me go deep into the history and he said see he is a devout jain and um, he undertakes a pilgrimage to palitana which is uh, one of the most uh, place where almost every jain would want to go at least once in a year they climb 3500 steps and then they come down 3500 steps many of them undertake a fast without drinking water so for almost one or two days they do not drink water and then climb some people do it seven times in two days so this middle aged person he went on this pilgrimage 5 am he started walking one day earlier did not drink water this that day also he didn't drink water came down did five such 3500 steps up and down and next day again he went by the time he came back two people had to of course bring him down and um, next day because of pain he took some painkillers and he realized his urine is dark and was unable to pass urine so this is what we call as um, uh, acute myoglobinuria leading to kidney disease of course yeah. because his muscles have was not trained in this kind of exercise yeah. he uh, did what is called as unaccustomed exercise and uh, along with it did not drink enough water Right. so that led to those myoglobin toxins blocking the tubules and right. eventually led to kidney failure right. so it's pretty common amongst the jain community to mm-hmm. do this most people do it once uh, in a day but some people do it 99 times in a month's time wow some people do it seven times in one day or two days and uh, I have seen actually quite a few such patients. Um, in fact, uh, they, we 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 almost presented a series of cases. Uh, almost felt like calling it as Palitana syndrome, um, <laughs> uh, mainly because they all uh, did this pilgrimage. And of course, it's 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 a very very um, energy wise a very strong energy which gives to the uh, Jain community. And mm-hmm. almost everybody wants to do it in their lifetime. Right. of course the point of this is not that somebody should not do this yeah. but yeah. just understanding that this is putting a tremendous amount of pressure on your muscles sure. and taking a trip like this requires training sure. just like say running, running a marathon, a marathon yeah. Yeah. or a triathlon yeah. nobody would expect you to run a marathon without any training similarly just because this is religious does not mean that you are yeah, yeah. safe from the consequences and it's not just with the jain community as hindus we, so i went to kailash mansarovar right we trained for one month uh, uh, on the national park up and down uh, at least um, almost uh, 10 kilometers a day to get trained in doing uh, the kailash mansarovar right. yatra similarly it's there in buddhists um, in jains we just did one in um yeah, bhutan yeah. which is to climb the mountain which is so strenuous that unless you are used to walking and using your muscles you could land up with uh, right. myoglobinuria in fact we did have a patient after the marathon uh, 42 so kilometers yeah. they uh, developed so uh, i think the key here is excessive unaccustomed exercise yes. so no, like you said nobody is asking you to not do it yeah. but you need to be trained like th- not just this there are so many people so who go to nashik shirdi who yeah. they walk it out completely and it's a yeah, 15 day trip yaar mandir to car mein jaate hain and then you want to climb a mountain and so- somehow the temples are also always situated oh, no. <laughs> on top of a hill so it makes it uh, more difficult for you to climb and you come back uh, satisfied that you have done something yes uh, but this is true because uh, say for example in islam um when people fast hmm. right uh if you are not used to fasting in that way a lot of people with migraine they might have controlled migraine for the rest of the year but when they start fasting a lot of times migraine can get triggered hmm. if you are not used to that pattern 
similarly in every religion i think there are certain things that you do yeah not really wondering what it will do to your body but because it is associated with religion so it's a very important thing to say ki karo but <laughs> dhyan se again we're not trying to band any community right now but it's again unfortunately belongs to an anecdote to jain community where i had this patient where i got a call from a nursing home that uh, the you know the saints want you to come and see the patient immediately because this lady is at the 28th day of her 30 day fast mm-hmm. where uh, she you know she she had gone to the hospital with uh, you know with loss of consciousness she mm-hmm. was she was having seizures which they had controlled with medications and her kidney functions were deranged so you know when we when i went and reviewed the reports her uh, serum sodium was uh, more than 172 so that's uh, one of the highest said that being yeah. a neurologist Uh, sodium 170 how often you encounter right. it, it was yeah so the highest i have seen is yeah. around 180 that yeah. too was during covid times right. because uh, in icus the on ventilator the patients ended up not right. drinking enough fluid so that's the highest i've seen and then probably 172 174 yeah. like i saw in this case so this lady was fasting for last 28 days without a drop of water without and you know without any meal mm-hmm. and um, you know when she came to the hospital her bp was low she was unconscious she she was seized, seizing and uh, her creatinine was elevated she, her uh, see, you know she also had some muscle uh, injury with her uh, you know uh, metabolic, metabolic derangements. derangements being there and uh, the only the first request when i spoke to the family was not just to save a life the first request was to do whatever it takes to get her better but not make sure not to feed her for the next two more days wow. so that they can Complete finish the fast of 30 fast. days wow so so that's that priority is clear yeah priority is clear so <laughs> that w- it was so also to add to this they were okay with me giving her iv fluids right. intravenous fluids was okay right. but Correct. nothing should go from the mouth right. so that again kind of uh, i understand faith is very important but i don't think our gods have told us to do this yeah. it is mainly a man made a uh, thought process mm. and i don't think we are all god's children i don't think they will want us to harm ourselves Absolutely. so if we are in harm's way uh, he would not have wanted us to continue this but then we ended up continuing the fast mm. uh, you know we hydrated her and when people have been fasting for so long they can face consequences mm, yeah. when we re- restart nutrition so we have to be very yeah, slow yeah something called yeah. refeeding syndrome refeeding syndrome yes. so which can cause heart arrhythmias heart beating to go away so refeeding syndrome, so, syndrome is when they haven't eaten for a long time, yeah. long time. and then they <coughs> eat so the electrolyte levels in the yes. body will become abnormal normal which and therefore heart arrhythmias heart yes. arrhythmias and other problems you know with uh, right. consciousness and seizures and everything can happen yeah. so so that was something which stuck in our mind the yeah. kidneys recovered ultimately mm. she was fortunate enough to yeah. uh, you know land in the hospital at the right time yeah. she would have been alone at home maybe the fate would have been something thank uh, god yes thank god yeah, yeah. so faith <laughs> and logic yes two yeah. different things and how do you try and uh, of course you being neuroscience person you would say limbic system a prefrontal <laughs> cortex but she also came for follow up 3 months down the line and she's like God save me. Of uh, course. So, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, course he didn't did. get credit, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, he felt happy. Yeah, absolutely. It. Yeah, I but felt this, happy that I helped her finish up. Yeah. yeah, you were doing God's work. Yeah, I yeah. was doing God's work. Yes. <laughs> How big of a problem is painkiller in our country? Huge, huge. Painkillers actually affect in different ways. We only think of painkillers causing kidney failure, but that's not. as common as it is perceived more importantly the first symptom could be if you take a couple of days of painkillers your urine output may drop a bit you will notice mm. that you are passing less urine than you used to pass with two days of painkillers uh, not always two days but in those who have a borderline kidney even two days is enough to reduce the urine output but for any other person even if he doesn't take long duration of painkillers even shorter duration you will see that he if he observes it very most people are not bothered how much urine they are passing but the urine output rather that's normal physiology if you take painkillers it affects the kidneys uh, filtration, filtration right. in such a manner that some drop in urine output right. but there are enough uh, compensatory mechanisms in uh, the kidneys to look care take care of that right 
you may notice a little bit of swelling in the feet mm. or in the eyes which is because of sodium retention mm. once you use painkillers the body retains a little more sodium little more water your blood pressure if it was well controlled suddenly after 8 days of treatment with painkillers you find are kya ho raha hai mera bp upar ja raha hai there is something mm. wrong and he comes to a doctor who can't fathom what is happening and you few realize it's because of painkillers pain retaining sodium and increasing the blood pressure those who have a borderline kidney function oh it could be very dangerous it mm. can increase their potassium and suddenly they can land up in an icu situation is very high potassium affecting the heart so what we know of kidney failure is just one aspect of painkiller related issues mm. so it has to be used cautiously you can give it for a shorter period you can warn him that stop as early as possible but if you develop any less uh, reduce urine output or some swelling report to us measure your blood pressure a little more don't combine it with certain drugs which are not right. good for the kidneys and so on mm-hmm. so yes you can take painkillers in fact uh, in um, fever and all sometimes people take it for longer periods uh, in in new illnesses not new but illnesses like chikungunya mm-hmm. where there is prolonged pain you may have to take painkillers yeah. for a longer time and that's where the challenge comes right as to how much to consume so not just chronic pain acute pain management can also be problematic when it comes to painkillers and one thing which i think uh, Uh, should be added to what Soros beautifully kind of described is that uh, co-prescriptions are also important. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of these patients who are diabetic <coughs> and hypertensive, uh, they are on medications which do affect filtration, yeah. okay, which is necessary to prevent further kidney damage. Mm. But they take away the compensatory mechanisms. So when painkiller is added to the mix, those compensatory mechanisms yeah. are gone, gone. Yeah. and it's a triple whammy. So mm. it, it kind of affects the kidney so badly that you can land up with. complete kidney shutdown also yeah. in even if taken for acute pain yeah. so chronic pain i understand it's very yes. deep rooted lot of multifactorial lot of psychology behind it but even in acute pain yeah. people find this quick fix of taking a painkiller yeah. where pain is supposed to be a natural defense mechanism it's god's way of telling you where the problem lies so rather than investigating the problem the first thing that we end up doing is you know mm, silence yeah. it down brush so it under the carpet, yeah. under the carpet rather right. than trying to get to the root cause of the problem atash talked of dehydration that's yeah. the situation where if you take painkillers yeah. it, it so we talked about the myoglobinuria yes. and the falitana syndrome yes. if you uh, are dehydrated and on top of that you take painkillers then as you said double whammy sometimes triple whammy. yeah so we talked of the problem how to mm-hmm. take painkillers safely is you follow sick day rules so if mm-hmm. you are on medicines namely tell me sartan or if you are on medicines such as dapagliflozin you should be very cautious about taking painkillers mm-hmm. and one thing which you can do is try to keep the hydration up and yeah. you can speak to your doctor can i discontinue this medicine for a bit or can i substitute it with something else mm. and usually for milder pains you can take safer painkillers mm. you don't always need to give strong pain that is going to be my next question um, which is safe versus unsafe painkillers yeah. is there a painkiller you would recommend versus one that you would absolutely swear off so i would no, swear i think you can yeah. you can't uh, completely avoid painkillers in uh, situations where your overall health is normal yeah. we permit okay safer is when you talk of kidneys then yeah. yes a larger dose of paracetamol would be safer than what we normally use ibuprofen diclofenac etc which are stronger painkillers in yeah. terms of giving more relief Right. Uh, uh rather better painkillers for yes. the patient yeah. but uh, little more harmful to the kidneys nimesulide 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 in fact some countries have, have banned, banned the use because yes. it affects both the liver and the kidney and yeah mostly. both liver and kidney in fact most of these diclofenacs and ibuprofens and nimesulides also work Um, not only harmful for the kidneys but also for the liver as liver. pointed out by yeah. so that's a double whammy double there also whammy there there so bodybuilders hmm. a lot of them do take a, do take a lot of proteins Correct. there is this understanding or sort of misunderstanding that taking all of that especially creatine powders can lead to kidney failure is there any truth to this so let's kind of imagine your body as a bucket hmm. with a hole in it okay so the, your level of creatinine will depend on how fast you're filling it up and how big the hole is which is leaking mm. so if you're filling it up faster your water level or creatinine level will go up mm. if you're removing it slower your creatinine will go up so if stay with me if you want so if you're 
if we correlate the hole to be smaller that means your kidney function is less your creatinine will go up mm. if we correlate filling faster as higher protein intake yeah. your creatinine will go up that does not mean that the kidney is not working mm. well that just means that you're producing more waste in the body yeah. and that does not necessarily mean that you have kidney problem mm. so coming back to the original question does creatinine or protein uh, harm the kidney no so they are safe to consume but it's quite important to understand that these are high solutes mm. which the kidney has to excrete mm. so this will predispose to formation of stones and interstitial diseases if you don't hydrate well right. so you take a lot of protein there is no harm but you ensure that you are very well hydrated because usually high creatinine high protein intake is done in gym goers theek hai so they uh, and they're working out where you know excessively again the risk of muscle injury and rhabdomyolysis yeah. which can harm the kidney mm. more importantly a lot of bodybuilders would consume diuretics yes to give more you know prominence to their muscles and yeah. guts especially when they're going for competitions yes mm. that harms the kidney that, that, not just protein intake right. so protein intake in isolation if i and you consume it it's okay for the kidney to right. work i so, think the message should be that not consuming proteins is far more dangerous yes. than consuming extra so this whole country mm. is uh, protein on a low protein, protein or protein deficient right. so so many patients when they get to know of kidney problems early kidney problems they stop, stop protein. proteins yeah. they stop this protein is so bad. common thing and it is so difficult to convince them yeah. to take proteins they like what kind of a doctor, doctor is this are you ke mm. tum kidney ka problem hai and you are asking us I to see. take protein oh, so that's difficult to convince them it's yeah. not protein which is actually Right. It, the other thing is creatinine in itself is harmless it's a mirror in the kidney it's uh, a function yes. it's a marker yes. so our intent should be to save the filters to save the kidney right. not in artificially bringing the creatinine down yeah. like he said a person who is 25 kg may have a kidney which is working 20 or 30% yet your creatinine can be normal so we are just fooling ourselves by yeah. reducing the protein intake mm. this just highlights that bodybuilders are in a trifecta of danger when it comes to kidney problems yeah. mm. so a high protein intake right. b excessive muscle use and c dehydration dehydration all three things can individually also cause kidney damage but mm. you put them all together and that can be really harmful so i would want to correct you there high protein intake won't damage the kidney got it coupled with dehydration it can then yes. then it can so yes. the only one corrective thing that they can do in their life is ensure that they are well hydrated and to stay away from diuretics yes that is some something. of them take steroids also yeah. anabolic steroids, steroids yes. is a whole other discussion yes yeah. so can the steroids that bodybuilders use hmm. does that cause kidney damage no so they no. are anabolic steroids most of the Correct. time so Correct. they don't cause kidney damage per se but they will have other effects right. which could be harmful including some will cause water retention some of them will cause mass hypertension hypertension yeah. and so on hepatotoxicity and, and yes. yeah. yeah so those things are there not really kidney right. disease uh coming back to the excessive exercise and all i again remember a student Hmm. who completed his mbbs had to appear for neat had free time he <laughs> thought let me do some exercises and he wanted to build up his muscles in a couple of days only because after that he has to join college and from day 1 and 2 he did unaccustomed exercise and again the same thing happened he landed up in myoglobinuria and uh, acute kidney injury right. so uh, you can develop this uh, muscle injury in various ways yeah. one of them would be an accustomed exercise of gym also yes, yes. and even doctors can can do succumb this succumb to this kind of uh, you know yes. in in i i draw a lot of correlation between gym and mental health yeah okay. so the way that gym affects your body is how stress affects your mind yeah so for me myoglobinuria is the mental health equivalent of anxiety disorders anxiety disorder. So if you go to the gym and you work out at your comfortable pace your mm. muscles will not be strained mm. too much mm. and so they will not break and then your kidney will not fail similarly in life if you are taking the right amount of stress mm. you can grow as a person but if it's too much mm. then anxiety disorder is the equivalent of myoglobinuria yeah, but mental health to be it will affect almost all organs including kidney so everywhere right. i think there will be a role of mental health 100% 